All right, so for this problem, we're going to be looking at sort of, I think, a simplified version of Noether's theorem. And uh, basically how this goes is we have a, a set of generalized coordinates. And based on this um, uh, family of mappings, we're going to um, change them to this other set of uh, generalized coordinates. And lambda here is just a parameter that we use in these mappings. So this is not like raised to the power of lambda or anything like that. It's just, it's just a label that tells us, you know, this is our transformed coordinates. Kind of like, you know, uh, um, lots of times we would just use a Q prime or something. But we're, we're just using lambda here to label it. Um, all right, so suppose we have this family of mappings that transforms these Q generalized coordinates into Q lambda generalized coordinates. Q lambda instead of Q prime or something. And um, suppose that leaves the Lagrangian invariant. So it may not um, quite look the same, right? I mean, this one has lambdas in it, right? And this one doesn't. Uh, but they are, in fact, the same function. Right, so suppose uh, that that actually happens, that we're able to um, make uh, this transformation based on these mappings, and um, and the Lagrangian stays the same. All right, if that is the case, and and notice, well, real quick, that we are not changing the time in this example. All right, if you go on Wikipedia or whatever, you'll find a more general. Um, view of uh, Noether's theorem. I believe that includes uh, the time, but we're not going to, going to deal with that. All right. If we do um, change these coordinates into these other coordinates, leaving the Lagrangian invariant, then this quantity right here is conserved. All right. So this is the partial derivative of each of our. Um, of our transformed coordinates uh, one at a time with respect to lambda with the, the parameter that we're using in our mappings and then once we take this partial derivative when we set lambda equal to zero and multiply by the, um, the, the momentum um, uh, for each of these coordinates all right and we take the sum of that this quantity is then conserved All right, so let's, um, just wanted to look at a couple of cases real quick before we uh, go into the problem here. So in, in this example right here, suppose we had a uniform gravitational field. So this would be at the surface of the Earth or something, right? We're assuming it's perfectly flat, right? Flat Earth, right? Okay, so um, we have a potential here that only depends on Y. All right, so that just means that if I draw a line like this, it, I drew it sort of poorly, but suppose this is all at the same value of y. The potential is not changing as we move across this line. So just as an example of, uh, of mappings, um, uh, if our y goes to y, but our x goes to x plus lambda, all right, right, it doesn't matter anywhere we go on, if we're shifting by x um, by an amount lambda, right, there's our, our parameter, so this is our, this is our mapping, uh, we're not changing the Lagrangian because this is, the potential only depends on y, not on x, right? So we can shift x as much as we want. The potential won't change. And uh, when you go and take the velocities, right, this lambda is a constant and drops out. And anyway, I think, uh, I think we're, uh, anyway, so I think that's one example of this, all right? Another example would be, suppose instead of being right next to the surface of the Earth with the uniform, roughly, gravitational field, 
now we're out in space somewhere, and now the potential is just per is just proportional to one over r. All right, so just a gravitational potential. All right. Well, now the circle that I've drawn is all at the same potential because these are all at the same r value. So it's symmetric with respect to uh, has has radial symmetry, just like this one had translational symmetry in this direction. All right. So um, so now, uh, if we were to do sort of a mapping, right, uh, we can leave r unchanged, um, but theta can go theta plus whatever we want. All right, and this mapping will leave the Lagrangian unchanged, and in the case up here, the the conserved quantity we end up getting is linear momentum, right, in, <coughs> in the x direction. Here we would get uh, a conserved quantity of angular momentum about this point. All right, so now let's go and look at the problem, okay? Um, so the problem is this weird symmetry that they give us, um, which is what they call helical symmetry, okay? So um, here we drew a line for a, sort of an equipotential, right? Uh, every point on this line has the same potential in our Lagrangian. Every point on this line has the same potential in our Lagrangian. And now we're on this helix. So every point on this helix, a sort of poorly drawn helix, is, is at the same potential. So. Um, so what this means um, is, so I'm going to use cylindrical coordinates here, okay? Um, so if I want to go from just taking these components separately, right? Uh, we want to go from Q to Q lambda while leaving the Lagrangian unchanged. So I'm going to leave R unchanged, all right? Uh, this Z, we will have a Z plus some constant, and I'm going to just continue with the same pattern, and I'll call this um, parameter lambda that we're using, okay? And theta, theta plus lambda. Okay, so I think in, in, yeah, in the problem, uh, they use alpha instead of lambda. Okay, so you can go ahead and make that um, substitution on your own if you want. All right, I'll, I'll just use lambda. Okay, so what this means is just that um, we're not just transforming one of the coordinates this time. We're transforming two of them, but in a very prescribed manner with relation to each other. So it means, uh, based on the pitch of this helix, right, which deals with this number c, this constant, um, based on the, the pitch of this helix, if we turn a certain angle, just for the sake of argument, say we turn 45 degrees or something, that means we're moving upward by some amount uh, based on based on C. All right, <coughs> so uh, we're transforming two of our parameters, but in a very um, they're they're in lockstep with each other, so that we trace out this helix. All right, and this is the um, surface or the the um, yeah. Um, it's an equipotential, all right? So this is, as long as we obey this, this rule, our potential stays the same and our Lagrangian stays the same. So let's go out and uh, or go ahead and just write the uh, Lagrangian, all right? Um, because, well, anyway. Um, so 
we have 1 half m, and then we have our velocities here. All right. So we'll have uh, the r dot squared for the r velocity. We'll have <coughs> z dot squared. Okay. And then uh, for circumferential velocity, we have r uh, theta dot. And these are both. So there we go. All right, so I wrote this in terms of these original coordinates here. Um, we, again, we're, what we're looking for is this quantity right here, because we want to know what is conserved in this motion. All right, so we need to find the momenta um, without, or before the before the transformation. All right, so we're just going to take derivatives of this Lagrangian with respect to uh, the, um, uh, the dotted variables, right? So let's just write, so here's the mom conjugal momentum of, uh, of R, okay. Okay, and this is just MR dot, all right, from right here. Uh, let's go ahead and do theta. So we have an m, and then we have an r squared, and a theta dot. Now we will do z. Just down z dot. Okay. So we found our our uh, our conjugate momentum for the for this this piece here. All right, and. Notice, though, that the potential is not dependent on the dotted variables, all right? So that's important uh, because otherwise we would get more terms in here, all right? Okay. Um, now we just need to find these other pieces right here. Okay. Um, let's go ahead and take another sheet. So... Uh, here we go. So what we want to find is, uh, let's call our, our first one is R, right? So, um, so the QJ is R. All right. Okay. And yeah, let's just go ahead and solve for this first. All right. So now we go and look up our r lambda is on this side over here so there's no lambda dependence all right and this equals zero all right we don't even have to evaluate it at lambda equals zero because it's already zero all right now let's do uh, theta so uh, theta respect to lambda here. Okay, so that's right here. All right, and uh, this, okay, so we're just taking the derivative of this side, all right, which is theta with the lambda on top, this side, our transform, okay, transform coordinate. Uh, we're taking derivative of this with lambda. There's a lambda right here, and we just get a one, all right? And there's no lambdas left over in here, so when we evaluate this at lambda equals zero, we still just get one. All right. Again, the reason we're evaluating these at lambda equals zero, all right, so we can get this piece of the expression. Okay, and our last one is with respect to, or uh, yeah, z uh, lambda with respect to lambda. Okay. Go ahead and evaluate it first. Um, all right, so our z lambda is right here, z plus c lambda. And when we take the derivative with respect to lambda, we get c. All right, there's no lambdas left over. So again, um, evaluating at lambda equals zero, 
we still just get C. Okay, so now let's put our pieces together. We want to find this quantity right here. So we're going to sum up these three different pieces. So PR and then um, let's just call this piece right here A sub R. All right, so just to illustrate, theta A sub theta plus uh, BZ A sub Z. Um, and to show that it's conserved, I'll just show the time derivative of this equal to zero, all right? So again, these A's, I, I just called this equals A R, um, just these pieces here. A theta, A Z, okay? All right, so this quantity here is conserved, all right? And what we want to do now plug in these A's and the B's. So, um, first of all, uh, A sub R, this part, is zero. Okay, so we don't even have to worry about our, our M R dot right up here. Don't worry about it at all. Um, now we have our A sub theta, which is one, and our P sub theta, is m r squared theta dot. So we have m r squared theta dot for this term right there. Okay, and now we'll do this last part. So p, well, let's do the a sub z first. Okay, that's a c right here. So c, and then the p sub z is just m z dot. Alright, so this tells us, we, I mean, we, can, uh, we'll, we can get rid of the M. So this um, tells us that the time derivative of R squared theta dot, so this getting rid of the M, uh, plus C Z dot is conserved. Alright, so it's just kind of this weird mixture of, you know, like an angular momentum around z um, mixed with this uh, constant um, uh, a sort of a, so linear momentum along z. You know, we put the masses back in, we get these momenta. All right, so angular momentum in this situation is not conserved by itself. And uh, the translational momentum in this direction is not conserved by itself, but together they do form a conserved quantity. All right. So remember, this is not like the path taken. Well, I guess it maybe it could be, but this is this is just a line of equipotential. All right. Just like we drew this line and this line. Right. So in this weird, I don't even ask what kind of, uh, you know, forces would, I don't know. I, 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 I don't know. I think of maybe a charged particle in a magnetic field or something, but, um, but just a weird, weird, weird potential with this weird helical symmetry and this quantity here is conserved. So as long as you have, um, your angular momentum and linear momentum mixed with this special number C um, for this potential, this quantity will be conserved. So there we go. We found we found a, a conserved quantity for for this uh, strange helical symmetry using this uh, sort of simplified version of Noether's theorem.